Did everything that Hong Kong endured in 2019 stem from the proposal to amend the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance? Was the impact of the violence limited to the livelihood of ordinary people? The answer in both instances is no. The name Chan Tong Kai was soon forgotten by the protesters. What Hong Kong endured was catastrophic. A number of intertwined forces were behind the violent protests in Hong Kong. At the forefront of the violence in the streets were the radical protesters, along with others who were simply dissatisfied with the status quo. Behind them were the anti-China forces in the West. Acting between the two forces were secretive intermediaries, represented by Jimmy Lai, Martin Lee, Anson Chan, and Albert Ho. Entrepreneur Jimmy Lai, the founder of media group Next Digital, has long been a sponsor of anti-China activities in Hong Kong, using the media under his control to incite political protests. Martin Lee, the founding chairman of the Hong Kong Democratic Party, fled to the United States during the amendment bill disturbances amid accusations that he had incited the violence. Former Chief Secretary Anson Chan, who helped to plan and instigate the protests, received regular donations from Jimmy Lai to fund the creation of anti-China chaos in Hong Kong. Albert Ho, chairman of the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements in China, is known to have been working for the U.S. intelligence service to promote U.S. interests. The four instigated the rioting, working with youth leaders including Joshua Wong and Nathan Law. They also colluded to mislead international public opinion by spreading distorted information. During the 2014 Occupy Central incident in Hong Kong, the media had disclosed emails proving that Jimmy Lai had provided funding to the men known as the Three Clowns of Occupy Central, namely Benny Tai, Chan Kin Man, and Reverend Chu Yu Ming. The emails also revealed donations he had made to Joseph Zen, Anson Chan, Martin Lee, and others. Jimmy Lai has also made regular donations to political parties in the U.S., all of which have been handled by his assistant, Mark Simon. Mark Simon is a former CIA agent. Lai is reliant on Simon for maintaining his contacts in the U.S. Since 2003, when he became a senior executive at Lai's Next Digital, Simon has been responsible for transferring more than 20 donations to American political parties. Whenever there is unrest in Hong Kong, invariably activists from the region meet in secret with prominent individuals in the U.S. This also happened at the time of the Amendment Bill riots. In March 2019, Anson Chan traveled to the U.S. at the invitation of the U.S. National Security Council. She publicly stated to Vice President Mike Pence that the United States has every right to question Hong Kong's human rights and the one country, two systems policy. In May, Martin Lee went to the U.S. and met Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. In July, Jimmy Lai also met Vice President Pence and Secretary of State Pompeo, as well as several Republican senators. During the visit, he had an article published in the New York Times in which he wrote, for the West to prevail, it must support the tiny little corner of China, where its virtues now operate, Hong Kong. Which is fighting the same war you have with, chi with, with China. Anyone familiar with American politics knows that the National Security Council, as the U.S. president's advisory body responsible for national security, military, and diplomatic affairs, is the brain behind U.S. attempts to subvert other governments. Following each of the U.S. visits by Anson Chan, Martin Lee, Jimmy Lai, and others, there was an immediate and noticeable upsurge in the violence in Hong Kong. The 
young people form the vanguard of the Hong Kong protests. Generally naive, credulous, impulsive, and blindly obedient, they were used as kindle by those intent on transforming Hong Kong into a political inferno. According to Hong Kong media reports, seven members of Jimmy Lai's family hold British passports. While other young people became embroiled in the street violence, he ensured that none of his own children were involved. On August the 3rd, the Hong Kong protesters launched what they called the Mong Kok Parade. This involved gathering illegally at night outside the Shim Sa Sui police station, causing a disturbance and lighting a fire. Amid the escalating violence in the streets, the Hong Kong media revealed that Martin Lee, Jimmy Lai, and others were secretly meeting an American named Christian Witten, a senior consultant for strategy and trade at the U.S. Center for the National Interest. In early June, Witten had published an article, Why Taiwan is America's Best Asset Against China. Its aim was to incite support in the West for Taiwan's independence. The article's publication coincided with the amendment riots in Hong Kong, and Witten sensed another opportunity to attack China. Carving this crisis for the Chinese Communist Party, for the government, um, at a time when we're, uh, frankly, at a, a difficult point in negotiations, this is good for U.S. national interest. On August the 6th, Anson Chen, Joshua Wong, Nathan Law, and other prominent figures in the protest met secretly with an American, Julie Ida. According to publicly available information, Julie Ida is the political counselor at the U.S. Consulate General in Hong Kong. However, her diplomatic career suggests she is a specialist in subversion, with expertise in handling international crises while maintaining a low key. Her department regularly publishes reports discrediting the human rights record of the Chinese mainland in Hong Kong. I think that um, this is the Hong Kong situation is not an isolated incident, but it has to be viewed in the context of the all the attacks that are being launched by the West against China. You know, the Huawei case, of course, the sanctions. Behind the Hong Kong chaos are a number of shadowy figures. Working hand in glove with outside forces, they have actively recruited, sponsored, and protected the protesters who have led the Hong Kong violence. They have made it their mission to destroy Hong Kong's prosperity and stability, even at the cost of the present and future well-being of the Hong Kong people. The chaos and violence that started in June last year is the direct result of the actions of these shadowy figures, who have no respect for the rule of law or love for the homeland. This is the Hong Kong that has been betrayed by local agitators. Today, traces of colonial rule can still be found in Hong Kong. Hong Kong endured 156 years as a colony. The Opium War was a turning point in Hong Kong's history. Before the Opium War, China exported highly sought-after silk, tea, and porcelain to Britain, receiving large quantities of silver in return. But for Britain, this created a trade deficit, and in order to reverse the situation, it began smuggling opium into China. For the merchants, the profits were huge, but as more and more Chinese people became addicted to opium, China began bleeding silver. The state's treasury and its people were being crippled. Eventually, the Qing government banned opium, leading to the outbreak of the Opium War in 1840. Hong Kong was built on stolen land, uh, stolen land from the Opium Wars that Britain, the U.S., France, Germany, the great powers of the time, but particularly uh, Britain, imposed on China. 
and it was a demand under the name of free trade to sell opium in massive quantities uh, throughout China. And when China resisted that, there was an invading army. In 1842, the Qing government was defeated and forced to sign the Treaty of Nanking, ceding Hong Kong Island to Britain. The settlement also permitted Britain to continue the opium trade. We have a, a long history of a colonial government in Hong Kong. And colonial governments are detached from the people. Their main job is to uh, develop the area for the benefit of the colonial power, which was us in the past. During the 2019 demonstrations, the protesters often carry the dragon and lion flag used during British colonial rule, along with the national flags of the UK and US. Many of those waving the flags had not experienced the colonial period. Somehow, they had become convinced that it had been a golden age. So was Hong Kong really so good under British colonial rule? After the British occupied Hong Kong in 1841, the territory was ruled by a succession of governors appointed by the monarch. The governor combined administrative, legislative, and military powers without being accountable to the people of Hong Kong. The British ruled uh, Hong Kong for slightly over 150 years, and they never allowed the, the election of the governor once, not in any form at all. For most of the colonial period, the Chinese, who accounted for 98% of Hong Kong's population, were denied equal citizenship and political rights. Early in their colonial rule, the British even enacted laws that openly discriminated against the Chinese. The famous writer Lu Xun referred to this when he wrote, as in today's Hong Kong's universal circulating herald, there are two such trivial matters. The first one is clear at a glance, and we know that the Chinese there are still being whipped. The second is that body search is not uncommon in Hong Kong. During the entire British era, which lasts until 1997, there was a de facto kind of apartheid that existed in Hong Kong. Chinese people were treated like third-class citizens. Leading British historian Keith Hopkins, in his book, Hong Kong, the Industrial Colony, also highlighted the discrimination against the Chinese, who tended to be amongst the poorest people in the colony. He described Hong Kong as a cruel society, where the poor had virtually no access to help. The young demonstrators would have been well advised to reflect on history before taking to the streets. They should have listened to the tales told by their elders and learned how Hong Kong people had really lived under British colonial rule. Then they could have decided what really was best for them. In 1997, Hong Kong's colonial history came to an end. But Britain and other Western forces were reluctant to simply disappear from the scene. They were averse to giving up their outpost in the Far East. These same outside forces would later foment the unrest during the Amendment Bill protests. On June the 13th, 2019, Marco Rubio and Jim McGovern were among a group of senators who reintroduced the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. On July the 8th, Vice President Pence and Secretary of State Pompeo met Jimmy Lai. On July the 9th, Jonathan Chancer, Senior Vice President at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, chaired a seminar titled Protests, Crackdowns, and the Future of Hong Kong, a conversation with Jimmy Lai. On July the 26th, Elliot Engel, chairman of the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee, accused the Hong Kong police of a violent response to peaceful demonstrations. On July the 30th, Jim Reich, chairman of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, requested the SAR government to withdraw the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance. But merely wishes to weaken China, to distract China from its uh, ongoing progress, distract it to a diversion. That's what the Hong Kong issue is. I think it's important for people to understand that the United States has a very long history of intervening in the affairs of other countries, you know, politically, you know, overthrowing governments openly or covertly. On November the 27th, 2019, President Trump signed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act into law.
。以我認識嘅國際法裏面，咧，每一個國家有國家嘅主權，係唔應該去干預第二個國家嘅內政，係違反國際關係、違反國際法嘅。The United Nations Declaration on Principles of International Law has the following stipulation. No state or group of states has the right to intervene directly or indirectly for any reason whatsoever in the internal or external affairs of any other states. So what does the United States hope to achieve with its flagrant violations of international law? The, the whole Human Rights Act 2019 is a product of politics. It's a product of anti-China politics. 针对美方无理行为，中国政府决定自即日起。On December the 2nd, 2019, the Chinese Foreign Ministry announced that China intended to respond to the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. It published a list of organizations it intended to sanction, including the National Endowment for Democracy and several other NGOs. 在香港修例风波中表现恶劣的非政府组织实施制裁。The National Endowment for Democracy, established in 1983, has a history of interfering in the internal affairs of other countries and even of meddling in elections. The NED claims to be a private, non-profit foundation, but there is clear evidence that most of its funding comes from the U.S. Congress. Imagine if Occupy protesters were waving Chinese flags and calling for... Independent journalist Dan Cohen once produced a nine-minute film about the Hong Kong disturbances. In it, he discussed the history of the NED. National Endowment for Democracy, which was founded in the 1980s after the CIA um, had such a bad reputation for basically backing death squads um, across Latin America, the Middle East, um, Southeast Asia. Um, and it, basically it was untenable. You couldn't have public support for this kind of thing in the United States. And so they founded the National Endowment for Democracy, which acts more above board and um, does the same job. The NGOs are operating from a playbook, a plan that was created by the National Endowment for Democracy and the CIA. Uh, we saw this happen in Yugoslavia in 1999. It was a socialist government with many ethnicities, and it was broken apart. The National Endowment for Democracy, NED, funded those protests. They trained the protesters. They were the operational power behind the protests. In the past few years, the NED has provided funding to the tune of 29 million US dollars for organizations and individuals dedicated to dividing China. More than 10 million of this was spent in Hong Kong. It's not all our fault, but we're partially involved. We have a large consulate there that's in charge with taking care of the Hong Kong Policy Act passed by Congress to ensure democracy in Hong Kong. We also have funded millions of dollars of programs through the National Endowment for Democracy to help democracy in Hong Kong. Throughout the Hong Kong unrest, the NED and other organizations acted as facilitators working on behalf of Western governments to provide planning, training, funding and materials for the Hong Kong protesters and stirring up public support for them. Well, it, it is very well organized, yes, yes. I mean, the, the leaders of this movement pretend that it is a leaderless movement, but uh, that's clearly not the case. This writing thing is well financed, well organized, they are even better organized than the police on logistics. In the logistics, from promoting legislation to training agents, the outside forces employed various means to encourage the Hong Kong protests. But as blatant interference in China's internal affairs, their actions amounted to a flagrant violation of international law and the basic norms of international relations. In the past few decades, Hong Kong and the mainland have achieved win-win cooperation and common development. The success of the one country, two systems policy has been acclaimed around the world. Yet the chaos resulting from the amendment bill tore Hong Kong apart and brought the SAR to its knees. This dealt a severe blow to Hong Kong's efforts to integrate into the overall development of China. The severity of the violence brought the Pearl of the Orient to the verge of collapse. 
Ultimately, the Western-backed anti-China chaos in Hong Kong would be a lost cause, but it could still hurt China. This is the Hong Kong that has suffered at the hands of outside forces. Hong Kong is a key international information hub. It has a well-developed media industry, and most Western media outlets have their Asia-Pacific headquarters here. If you look at the Western media, there is a general uh, misrepresentation about what's going on in Hong Kong in general. But I think this is ultimately part of the double standard. You can see that the West is absolutely taking a one-sided unilateral approach. In Hong Kong, if there's some tear gas fired or some policeman is seriously life-threatened and he takes out his gun, he doesn't fire his gun at anybody, he just says, you know, go away, right? This carries huge uh, publicity. This is just absolute, complete hypocrisy. Yet the loudest voices coming out of Hong Kong distorted the truth. The Western media, as well as some of Hong Kong's own outlets, such as Apple Daily, never mentioned the protesters attacking first or the violent tactics they employed. Instead, they concentrated on showing the police waving their batons and firing rubber bullets. On July the 28th, a series of illegal marches were staged in Central and other areas. The police arrested 49 people, 44 of whom were later charged with rioting. Some of the detainees were held at Kwai Chung Police Station, which then came under siege by other rioters. Lao Chuk K and his squad were ordered to the police station where they arrived at 7 a.m. on July the 30th. By 6 p.m. that evening, the station was surrounded by more than 2,000 protesters. Inside, Lao and his men were keeping a watchful eye on developments. At 11 o'clock, they noticed a man lying unconscious, having been attacked by the mob. They decided to form a sortie party to go out and rescue him. However, during the rescue attempt, Lao was separated from his men. Struck to the ground, he was set upon by the mob. Helped by his colleagues, Lao got to his feet and aimed his weapon at the mob to keep them at bay, but he did not shoot. The provisions of Chapter 29, Usage of Force and Firearms of the Hong Kong Police General Orders, state that police officers may use firearms under the following circumstances. One, to protect anyone, including the officer's own person, from harm to life or physical damage. Two, where there is reason to believe that someone committing a serious violent crime should be arrested, or a suspect who has committed a serious violent crime attempts to resist arrest. Three, to suppress disturbances or riots. Lao Chuk Ke insists that his purpose was to rescue the injured man. He pointed his gun at the mob out of frustration. He was also armed with a pistol that could fire lethal rounds. According to the regulations, he was permitted to use that pistol in self-defense. Yet he didn't use it. Jiba Chang, Tai Wei Xian, Wei Xian, Bu Zhang Shang Yun. 
他们现在看来，他们完全不知道我们在，呃，爱惜他们，他们的的表现告诉我，他们根本就没没没有当过我们我们警察系人。Later that same night, a photograph of Lao Chuk Kei pointing his gun at the crowd spread across the internet. In a deliberate attempt at distortion, certain media organizations presented the incident not as a police officer being attacked by thugs, but as a police officer being guilty of unprovoked violence against peaceful demonstrators. I was wounded until now. The media in Hong Kong has never found me. They don't even know what I'm doing. They don't even know what I'm doing. 他们不想给你个机会去澄清。香港全媒把我们的像香港现在的情况呢，黑把倒转来说，媒体一一个风一面倒的把我们呃警察说成是黑警。Always the camera was focused on the law enforcers and ignored the protesters, and always questions were asked from a biased standpoint. Reports were often based on rumor. And the resulting arguments inevitably reached unfounded conclusions. The media, while claiming to be objective and neutral, was in fact resorting to selective and distorted reporting. Elements of the Hong Kong media also colluded with their Western counterparts to cast the mob's behavior in a rational light. They don't like the reporting from we're doing. The most frequent form of distortion is to take one aspect of the situation and grow, 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 enormously increase its importance out of any balance of the situation. There's fake news and what I would call falsified news. Timely, comprehensive and truthful reporting is the lifeblood of the media. Being unbiased, professional and objective are the fundamental principles any reporter must observe. Regrettably, amid the chaos in Hong Kong, some parts of the Hong Kong media acted as spokespersons for the West. They did everything they could to discredit the Hong Kong police, vilify the SAR government, glorify the protests and incite social unrest. Through their actions, they were guilty of fueling the violence in Hong Kong. Two types of black terror ravaged Hong Kong at the time. One was the visible brutality unleashed in the streets, the other was rumor. This is the Hong Kong that is filled with malicious lies. On October the 20th, 2019, Hong Kong's Wenwei Daily published a picture of a Hong Kong middle school textbook. The headline read, Celebrities of Traditional Chinese Virtue. The celebrity the text dealt with was none other than Joshua Wong. <laughs> Joshua Wong is certainly a well-known figure, but he is more infamous than famous. A leader of the Hong Kong protests, he visited several Western countries, begging them to impose sanctions against his fellow countrymen. Such actions have nothing to do with traditional Chinese virtues. Yet he is glorified in textbooks. Clearly, there are serious problems with school education in Hong Kong. Education shapes the younger generation. Since 2012, general education has been a compulsory exam subject for Hong Kong high school students wanting to enter university. The other three subjects are Chinese language, mathematics, and English. The Hong Kong Education Bureau states that the purpose of general education is to make students become responsible citizens and look at the opinions and values held by others with an open and tolerant attitude so as to become a lifelong learner with independent thinking ability. This is the original idea of general education, however. General education is divided into six units, personal growth and interpersonal relations, Hong Kong today, modern China, globalization, public health, and energy, technology, and environment. 
However, against the backdrop of the protests, two issues came to the fore. First, would the teachers spread their time evenly across all six units, or would they spend more time on politics? And second, how would teachers handle the sensitive political issues covered by the Hong Kong Today unit? Inevitably, education became politicized and some basic information about China was neglected. Chinese history had been a compulsory subject, but in the course of several education reforms, it became optional. Still, some of Hong Kong's Chinese history textbooks contain obvious bias. The Takung Daily published a screenshot of a Chinese history textbook used by Wong Kong Fai Secondary and Primary School, which is affiliated to the Hong Kong Baptist University. In the chapter entitled, Why Did the Opium War Break Out Between China and Britain? There is no mention of the vast quantities of British opium imports, which bled the Chinese treasury dry and turned countless Chinese people into drug addicts. Instead, it refers to China's arrogance and depicts the war as merely a conflict between political, trade, and judicial systems. Such distortions of historical facts have rendered some young people in Hong Kong ignorant of their local history and unable to identify themselves with the Chinese nation. This raises the question, if a young person has no knowledge of or familiarity with his own country, how can he love it? Miss Leung was born and raised in Hong Kong and is the mother of two children. But she is very worried about the environment her children are growing up in. Education appears to be sick. And if this is the case, it must be the educators who are to blame. In Hong Kong, there are many in the teaching profession who harbor extreme ideas, to the point that they advocate violence and encourage their students to stir up trouble. Some teachers are very eager to expect their political will and, and exert their influence on, on students. Okay, because they have very strong political stance, and some of them may 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 want to uh, do something against the uh, HASAR government. Amid the amendment bill protests, some teachers even included the demonstrations as materials in exams. The illustration was included in an exam paper. It depicts four ugly-looking police officers carrying a demonstrator away. The question requires students using their own knowledge to explain the advantages of the demonstrator's demands. Some of Hong Kong's teachers, rather than educating their young charges, are ruining them. The Hong Kong Professional Teachers Union is made up of teachers from universities, middle schools, elementary schools, and kindergartens. It is the largest single-sector trade union in Hong Kong. However, it has long been under the control of people with a hidden agenda. In 2013, the Teachers' Union published a paper, Hong Kong's Political System Reform, taking Occupy Central as the example, which was included in the Civil and General Education textbook. Benny Tai, co-founder of the illegal Occupy Central movement and an advocate of civil disobedience, was cited as a consultant. In August 2016, Ip Kin Yoon, the leader of the Teachers' Union, addressed the issue of students promoting Hong Kong independence on campus. He described them as having independent thinking, personal opinions, and interest in current affairs, showing a stronger sense of locality. During the protests against the amendment bill, the Teachers' Union actively initiated demonstrations Demonstrations. It encouraged academics to protest in Victoria Park and strongly express their political demands. According to information published by the Hong Kong Education Bureau in December 2019, during the protests it received a total of 123 complaints relating to the professional conduct of teachers, mostly involving the incitement of hatred. 80 people were arrested. 
，就是形成了价值是非的虚无化，就可能对一些行为，特别一些反社会的行为、侵害他人的行为，没就缺乏了约束力，就会呃把这个扩大化了。比如说他的极端的自我主中心自我主义、极端利己主义等等。啊，还有就是反叛的那个极端的、极端性的反叛的等等，都变成了在他这个年龄里面的一些呃特质。It's this education system that turned out political Molotov cocktails like Joshua Wong. Instead of sitting in a classroom learning, they were fanning the flames of violence. In the pursuit of what they believed to be freedom and democracy, they unleashed rampages across Hong Kong's campuses and physically assaulted those who disagreed with them. While claiming to represent the future of Hong Kong, they were in fact complicit in its destruction. In an article published in the New York Times, Joshua Wong once wrote, "Safeguarding what has made Hong Kong unique is in Washington's interest." This is the Hong Kong that has fallen prey to anti-China education. In 2019, Hong Kong was dragged to the verge of a precipice. According to the SAR government's 2019 Economic Overview and 2020 Outlook, Hong Kong's economic output fell for the first time in 10 years, with the economy contracting by 1.2% in 2019. Private consumption decreased for the first time since 2003, and tourism was hit by a record decline. Overall investment experienced its largest fall in 20 years. All the facts indicate that the purpose of the violent protests in Hong Kong was to paralyze the SAR government, seize its power to govern, and then turn Hong Kong into an independent or semi-independent political entity. Ultimately, the one country, two systems policy would be scrapped. But now people are asking, where is Hong Kong headed? Will one country, two systems be upheld or destroyed? Will the rule of law flourish or be trampled down? Will Hong Kong maintain her prosperity and stability or be ruined? Hong Kong and the mainland are in a community of shared destiny, connected by blood and by history. This relationship and the importance of one country, two systems are something Hong Kong society needs to fully understand as ultimately they will guide Hong Kong out of its troubles. The spirit of Lion Rock should not be about nostalgia and melancholy. With wisdom and courage, the people of Hong Kong can emerge from the shadow of the protests and see the bright path ahead.